hello if you're watching it live uh, watching this live this is friday's stream and we're a little bit late i'm about 10 minutes uh off where i thought i would be because i've been out uh i've been out this morning which is kind of different to what i normally do and done something that i said on previous streams i was hoping to do um so i will like quickly look at what i've been doing this morning and then we're going to do the Pi Hut Maker Advent Calendar Day 3. Um, in terms of the other stuff we've been doing on these streams, nothing came in the post today except for a Christmas card. Um, and there isn't actually a steady stream of Maker stuff coming in the post. There's, there's a steady stream of Maker stuff in the bins behind me that we'll pull out and play with on this channel as we go forwards. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll see what's what. But uh, for now, we're we're focusing on the uh, the Python twelve projects of Advent Advent calendar thing. And today is going to be day three. And basically, the deal with this, if you're not familiar with it, is that I am doing this pretty much blind, so I have not seen what's in the boxes, and I've not looked ahead as to what the instructions are. So you can kind of watch me uh, muddle along through it. And what we did yesterday was we built something that I've actually, um, in the off time, tidied up the wiring a little bit for it. And let's see if we can get it into focus a little bit more with my special Logitech app. Um, I put all the wiring around one side so that the wires are kind of out of the way. But other than that, it's as it was at the end of the last live stream, which is there's three LEDs there that are hooked up to. Uh, Raspberry Pi Pico, and they've got resistors on them. And uh, let's see if we can uh, adjust this a little bit. How's about something like that? I still need to put that target on the mat here so we can see what's going on. Um, but we got something that approximated traffic lights. They're all clear LEDs when we look at them, but when you turn them on, one's red and one's yellow. It's green and so on. Um, so. I just tidied that up from yesterday, left it where it was. We were doing MicroPython code and so forth. And if you want one of these kits, they're still available at the Piper. Um, this is not sponsored by them or anybody else. I bought this with my own money and I'm just playing around with it. It seems to be a really well put together thing with good instructions. So if you're looking for something to do after you've done all the other things on Christmas and you know, you're kind of bored, try that out. So. We've got that. That's that's uh, on its way, and uh, we'll we'll get to that shortly. But let's just put this back like this. So, what did I do this morning? Um, I said I went out. So we went out and discovered somewhere that we've not been to before that you can't normally go to. So that's kind of exciting. Um, let's bring this onto the stage here. So what we did was. Um, I've usually got a cup of coffee with me for these live streams. Um, keeps me going. And uh, that coffee comes from a company called 200 Degrees, and they are based here in Nottingham. They do all of their roasting and production here. And today and tomorrow, if you're local and you want to try it, they are opening in the mornings. So you can go to the roast house, which is like an industrial place that you can't normally go into and see what their production process looks like. So we got a tour of, um, it's quite a small facility actually, but we got a tour of everything from green coffee coming in through to being roasted and basically dried out and bagged and packaged and, and put right for shipping to either shops or to people who subscribe or just buy stuff on the, off the website. So that's what we did this morning. It was kind of Interesting, had a little bit of a walk around afterwards as well. And um, won't mean anything if you don't know Nottingham, but basically they're dead opposite Notts County Football Club. So reasonably easy to get to. Um, open tomorrow if you wanted to try it. So that's what I've been up to. Um, I tweeted about this. If you if you want to follow me on Twitter, and we're still going to call it Twitter on this channel, then um, that's how you find me down there. So enough of that. We've got probably quite a short stream today because like I said I've been doing other topics as well as the maker advent calendar um one thing that I did think about doing was on the website somewhere down here we've got a where's it gone let's 
let's see. When I used to do regular live streaming before, I made a page on my website and kind of like this is the the landing page for all of the projects that we did on the on the live stream, some of which took up multiple live streams over several weeks. So if you look at, for example, the plane spotting project, which was probably the most complicated one, um, that uses all sorts of equipment. And it had multiple videos that you can see are embedded here in the page. So I thought what I'll do, and I'll probably do a bit of this on the live stream, is make a page like this for the um, the PyHut Advent Maker project. And then, you know, there'll be like 12 boxes, so maybe 12 videos and just a little bit of commentary so that there's a bit of a structure and somewhere that people could come to later and, and learn about this. The other thing that I've done in between streams is put everything so far into a playlist on my YouTube channel. So if you're watching this on YouTube, go find the playlist. Um, I realized that I also, and I'll make a note about this now, I need to put the YouTube link on the website. So the channel's kind of always been there. And it's got a couple of hundred subscribers, but it's just been somewhere that I periodically put project videos and then write about them. It's not, this is the first time of actually generating a decent amount of, of content that's sort of video led. So I need to put that on here and maybe up here in the header so people can find it more easily. But that is for another day. So today we are back with the Maker Advent Calendar, uh, the 12 projects of Codemass version. As I've said before, there's a second version of this that focuses on LEDs. It has a black box. We have this one that has the sort of more, uh, I guess that's reddish colored box. Uh, we have that one. And what we've been doing is looking at this daily box guides here. And it's easy to identify what we've got. We've got that one. And then we did day one. So day one was get the, uh, the Pico install MicroPython runtime on it. What else did we do? Hooked it up to Thonny, wrote some basic code with the built-in LED and pushed it into the breadboard, all of which was supplied. Day two, we built the circuit that you can see on uh, the second camera there. So we built that with some LEDs, resistors, and jumper wires that they provided in day two's box. Uh, it said to leave it alone for day three, so we're not going to have anything uh, yeah, we're not going to be starting from scratch here. We're going to be building on whatever we ended up with day two from. So I'm going to click day three, and this is literally the first time I'm, I'm seeing this. I've not pre-empted this. So, ooh, buttons. Okay. So welcome to day three. Today we'll be adding physical inputs. So, yeah, the two things you can use the GPIOs, the pins on these microcontrollers or regular Raspberry Pis for are inputs and outputs. Um, the LEDs are an output, you know, we send some voltage and the output is, it turns that voltage into light so we can see it. And as they say here, yeah, so far we've relied on code to tell the LEDs what to do. Now we can do physical buttons that act as triggers. So like event-based pro programming. So if you're familiar with the web or something, you know, when I press this like add to cart button, there'll be an on-click handler for that somewhere and some JavaScript runs. We're going to do that sort of in the physical world, but with MicroPython, I guess. Um, so in this box, you will find one mini breadboard, so another breadboard, some tactile buttons. That's, I guess, those things down here. Oh, no. So I, uh, I thought they were like twisty potentiometer things. Maybe they're the buttons, because then it says there's button caps. So those are probably on the top. And seven jumper wires. That's quite a lot. So. That's what we can expect in here. And we're going to be programming the buttons in your box as inputs for the code. So fair enough. Let's get box three out and see what is, is in here. So step one is make sure that uh, box three contains what you expect it to. So let us go over here and have a look at this and move that out of the way. Put box three here. So box three, there we go. There is indeed, everything's in a neat bag. 
I'm going to try and box these back up afterwards when we finish with this. And then we'll see what the future of this advent calendar is because yeah, it's a nice project for something to do. Right. So we've got a mini breadboard, we've got wires, and we've got um, switches and switch caps. Right. So let's get those out and see what's next in a minute. So the mini breadboard also has got the sticky thing on the back. So to save it skating around a workplace, if we wanted to like make something semi-permanent, we could stick it down. I'm not going to do that because we're going to want to move it. Then we've got, wow, these things, buttons. The buttons have the caps on already by the looks of it. So that step's been done for us. Put the bag out of the way. And then we've got more of these wires that we've had before. Okay, so it looks like we've got all the parts. That's good. Um, so what's next? Today we'll be programming the buttons in your box as inputs for our code. Okay. While we can easily use code to figure our program to do things like counting, components like buttons and switches allow us to physically interact with our project. So, yeah. You could do this by touching two wires together. I mean, that's essentially what the button does when you press it, it completes the circuit. So we're going to use the mini breadboard as a little control panel for projects. Okay. The button caps, they're just a nice little extra, okay, but they're already applied. So first off, make sure your Pico is disconnected from your computer. Uh, it is. I've not plugged the USB in, so that's good. Now grab the mini breadboard and pop each button into it a few holes apart, making sure that the legs sit either side of the little channel in the middle. So the breadboard, remember from yesterday, is divided into like two sections and they don't, they're distinct from each other. The wiring doesn't cross the, the trough in the middle, if you like. So what we need to do is create something that looks like that. So let's do that. So they need to straddle the, uh, the center channel. So, all right, let's do this. So I've got one there and pressed in. We're just going to do the same with the others. And it doesn't seem to matter precisely where we put them. So let's do both of the ends first. So that was quite a satisfying noise. And three is going in whenever I can. It's about right in the middle, near enough. All right, so we've now got a breadboard, mini breadboard with, I don't know if you can hear that, but let's hold it to the microphone clicky buttons. So we've got three buttons set up on our mini breadboard. So what do we do next? Now we need to connect a 3.3 volt pin from the Pico to the top red lane on our main breadboard. So some of these pins on the Picos, we can turn the power on and off, um, which is how we control things. Some of them are like permanent Power. So if you just want to power something and share the power source that the Pico's got, so like the USB power source in this case, then it guarantees, you know, it's basically like constant out power. It's like wiring something to your car that works when it, the um, keys are in the ignitions are on. If the Pico's running, it'll be powering the thing. So it says we need to connect physical pin 36 and we haven't got a handy um, diagram PDF from yesterday. So maybe what we'll do here is just pop to day two. And they provided this really handy PDF. Here we go. And we can make this nice and large. And it says we want 36. So yeah, it's over here. Look, 3v3 out. And that's basically permanently powered by the looks of it. 
So I'll put this over on the right there for the minute. And let's go back to day three, right. So we need to connect the 3v3 pin to the top red lane on our main breadboard. Pop a jumper wire 3v3 out on 36, then connect the other side to the top red lane. So we want the actual, not this mini board, we want the big one. So on the big board, I'm going to use all of these wires that are kind of stuck together again, a little bit glued. So I'm going to use a red one for power. Again, just convention, but handy people will understand what it means. We're going to use the red one. And the red one is going into the um, positive on the board and 36. So let's go find 36. If we have the USB and then 36 is right hand one oh it's pretty near where i'm using ground uh, so one two three four five down one two three four five down this is looking like that so yeah let's hold this up under the camera there so we've just put this red connector in that connects 36 to the uh positive rail on the board so all of these will now have 3v3 power everything down that, that positive rail there so what do we do next i'm guessing we probably need a ground cable but let's see uh, dear. lastly we need to connect oh, no, we don't okay Hang on. you then need to connect the red 3v3 lane to one side of each of the buttons go for the right side like we have below so we need to get our other breadboard there. And then we're going to need three connections. I haven't got three red ones. I haven't got three of the same color. So we're just going to use something else. I'm just going to separate all of separate all of these off the ribbon. So we've got easily accessible ones. I'll, I've got one red one. I can use that. I've got a yellow one. I can use that. And I've got a white one, we'll use that. So we use red, yellow, and white. So we want 3v3 to one side of each of the buttons. Go for the red, the right side. So everything in the track that lines up there is essentially the same thing. The same. If I plug something into there, it's going to power all of those pins. So we'll go for the right hand side of each switch. I've got one there. I got a second one and a third one. Yeah, right like that. Okay. So I'm sort of switching between cameras here, but we've now got things lined up with the right hand legs up there. And then it says they all go into this three volt power rail that we've created here. So we need to doesn't really matter, I don't think, where. Well, it definitely doesn't matter where. So we'll just put them all into bits of the breadboard there. So we've now got a circuit that is connecting the two breadboards. Let's just bring that up on the bigger view for a second so that we can see, see it and move it so that my head's not in the way. There we go. So three buttons, three wires. They're all going into that power rail there, which is being powered off the Pico. So at the minute, we've got everything's got power connections. So bringing the desktop back, let's see what the next steps are. Lastly, we need to connect the other side of the buttons to the GPIO pins. Yeah, because we've got power right now. We don't have um, anything that we can like read in our code to, to determine what the state of the button is. So 
add a jump away to GPIO 13, 8, and 3. That's pins 17, 11, and 5. So we're going to use our diagram. And OK, there's a link to it here now. Um, so yeah, we need so the left hand sides of each of these. Go to those pins. OK, so I want three wires. I've got black, black and white left, which is um, conventionally unusual because black should probably be ground, but we'll run with whatever we've got. If I was doing this with like a huge selection of these jumper cables, you can buy big, um, big loads of these off of like Amazon, eBay, Primarone, Adafruit, Pi Hut, um, all those places. I would probably use different colors to separate out, you know, positive ground and data, but we're just going to run with this. So we need to connect the left leg. So that's this one. And we're going to do that three times. So we need the left leg of the other one. It goes there. And then this is going to get messy. The left leg of this one goes there. So I've now got three separate cables that are dangling around doing nothing. So they need connecting. So on theirs, they've got the leftmost one connects to whatever this one, two, three, fourth one is away from the debug up here. So that's Looking at the diagram over here, one, two, three, four, that's physical pin 17. Yep, so that's one of the ones that they want. So the first one here, this white one, is going to go um, one, two, three, four, and that's quite stiff, but it's gone in. So the, the white cable there has gone in. I'll bring this up on the bigger camera when we've done all three. The second one, they've got as a green cable here. That is going into physical pin 11 then. So that is 11 down from the top. So there's this, here's the second one. And let's count so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, double check, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And I've lost my train of thought. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And plug you in. And then the last one, physical pin 5, is the fifth one down. So that's in this mess of wires, I've got one remaining, a one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so let's see if we can make this bigger and take a look at it now. So we have got now each of those switches, one on one side goes to power, the other one goes to a GPIO, a controllable pin on the Pico. And here you can see everything in this area here. The one side of the, the red line is the data stuff. And on the other side, it's the power. So we have got all of those hooked up. Yeah. And then the power is coming off of the Pico, off of a permanently powered uh, pin. So, okay, back to the desktop, see what is going on. Ah, the GPIO pin must be on the opposite side of the button. Yep, we did that, so we wired them upside. So when we press one of these buttons, it's essentially going to get create a connection between the two vertical tracks and complete a circuit is what I assume is going to happen. So we'll first run a simple test program on one of the buttons. Each button has been wired to GPIO. Yep, we did that. 
So we can set these as inputs. This is going to be new because so far we used the GPIOs as outputs. Uh, we didn't have any inputs. And um, oh, hello, Piers. That's a uh, Piers from um, I know Piers from the Oxford Python group. I have been down there and done a, a talk with them for their meetup group in Oxford. And Piz has also been working with the MeArm to do a MicroPython controller for that. Um, and the MeArm is also a product from up here in Nottingham. So um, I'm sure Ben from MeArm at some point will watch this. So hello, Ben, if you want to shout out at some point, just join in. But uh, yeah, so back to buttons. So we are going to use inputs rather than outputs. And we're going to use a while loop, which we learned about yesterday. Yep. Um, and then we're going to need an if statement because every time we go around our while loop, either the button's going to be pressed or it isn't. So, so we'll sort of skip over some preamble about what if statements are. Basically, it's if some condition is met, do some things. And then optionally, there's an if the condition is not met, otherwise do some other things. So let's see. So also, we need to look at a new concept apparently called pull downs. OK. so. I understand why, but let's see how they explain this. So when we set up a pin, we have to set the pin to be pull down. So why do we do this? So when we're using the button, we're sending 3.3 volts because we powered it to a permanent power source off of the Pi, of the Pico. Um, we're sending volts to the GPIO pin to set it high. So before, when we used them as an output, we toggled whether the pin sent power out. Now what we're saying is we're sending power into the pin. And what the pull-up does is make sure it reads low to start with. So um, the pull-up ensures that we're in a good known state to start with, which is low or off. Uh, and then as it says, if you don't do that, you can end up sort of floating between 0 and 3.3 volts. It's an electrical thing. And then it goes on to say, sometimes you might need to put a resistor in the circuit to deal with this. The Pico's got this built in, and we can control it in software. So we can say whether this pin, because the G part of GPIO is general. It's a general purpose I input and output pin. We can uh, just switch things around and determine if, um, if we're using this for input or output. And then if we're using it for input, what state we want it to like default to. And we're saying here we want it to be down or low. Okay, so the initial sample code just uses the first button. It includes our usual imports and pin setup, then it starts a while loop. The while loop contains an if statement that looks for a high signal on GPIO 13. So we're saying to the Pico, pull this pin down and assume it's at the low state, and then check it. And if you see it's at the high state, that's because the button's been pressed and the circuit's been completed. So we're pushing 3.3 volts in when, when that's happened. And then we're going to just print button pressed. Um, so we're going to do output to the console in a minute. And we'll use a short delay in this loop to give your finger a chance to release the button and to avoid the code triggering many times from a single press. This is something that you'll see when you deal with buttons a lot. There's something called a debouncing algorithm and some higher level frameworks that deal with buttons support this directly, which is if I press the button, you want to continuously know that it's still pressed or do you want to say, oh, you know, any press within like half a second counts as, as the same press and I would have to release it and, and press it again to get a new press. Kind of depends what you want to do. If you want a sort of continuous trigger like, you know, infinite shooter game, then you maybe don't want the debouncing. If you want it to be like, I press and the doorbell rings, then you do want the debouncing because otherwise the doorbell is going to ring. So we've got a complete program here. Let's have a look at it here today rather than just copying it into Thony. So we're going to again get the pin and the time module like we did previously. This time we're using pin 13 and we're using it as an input before we used it as an output. And because we're using it as an input, there's this second argument, or do we want it to pull up or, or down? Do we want it to default to essentially on or off? We want it off. We're using pull down. Then we have the similar loop to yesterday. Let's just loop forever. 
Um, let's go to sleep for 0.2 of a second, because remember, there's nothing else running on this microprocessor. So if we don't do something, essentially nothing, nothing else is going to interrupt it. There's no other code. And then if button one, which is that pins value. So yesterday we were setting the value as an output to not all one. This time we're saying if button one is is one, so the circuit is high and we've let the current through it, then we know that it's been pressed. So let's copy all of this lot. And let's um, paste it into Thonny here. So that's OK. And then we should probably power up the, uh, the Pico. But I'm going to check they don't want us to do anything else to it. No, it doesn't look like it. So let's power up the Pico here. Let's see what happens. Hopefully, what doesn't happen is um, bad things in smoke. So I'm going to run this code. Oh, I'm going to connect to the Pico first. There we go. We've, so when you first plug it in, you kind of it's counterintuitive, but you have to press this stop button. But even though nothing was running, because it's a stop restart button. So what that's done is it's it's got us to the console, and we can now send code to the machine. So press that, and we've got no output here. And if I mess around with this. Let's try and find, I think the first button was, oh, there we go. First button's the closest one. So button one pressed, button one pressed, pressed, pressed. If I hold it down, it does keep repeating, but there's, because of that sleep in there, it's, there's a little bit of a delay. And then it starts to scroll and you can't kind of see when I'm pressing it again. But it seems like that's working. So we've got button one, which is the one, as I look at it, it's on my right is pressed and when i don't touch it like this if i clear the console you'll see it's steady state nothing's happening if i press it again it's been pressed so that seems to be behaving we seem to have built circuit correctly and we didn't blow anything up um, i also have been streaming long enough to trigger this automated thing here which is a uh, a bot automation that i've been playing with on twitch so that seems to work that's nice Right, so back to day three, activity two, multiple button inputs. I guess, you know, we we built three of these things. We should probably use them for something. So let's add our other buttons and change our if statement to make it watch for any of them being pressed. So we'll add set up lines for the other buttons. So pretty much similar to what we had for the first one, additional if statements. If one of the conditions is met, it will run the code for the loop and so on. So yeah, this is basically the same thing. We've just got three times the number of buttons here and that they're, they're attached to different physical pins. And then we're doing the same thing with each button object and just outputting whatever bit, bit of text. Right, so let's do that. Stop what we had before, run this. And so now what we should see is one, two, three. So looks like all three buttons were wired up correctly. We didn't screw it up, which is what you want. So yeah, that's basically just repeating what we had before, 13, 8, and 3. They're all pull downs. They're all input pins. We've got the same delay and so on. So oh, there's a third activity today. So what if we wanted to do something more advanced? Maybe we want to ignore 2 and 3 if 1 is pressed. Do we want something else to happen if nothing's pressed? Okay, maybe we want something if we hold two down at the same time, like some sort of power move. So we can do these things with an additional statement, elif and else. So what do those do? Oh, they've explained it here. This is great. Um, so elif is short for else if. So if the first condition isn't true, then it will try this, this next one and keep trying them until it finds one that's true or it runs off the bottom. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we'll use if then lf to tell our code to check if button one is pressed, and if not, check two, and if two isn't being pressed, check three. Hmm. That's interesting because I'm not sure that's going to behave too differently other than before. I suppose you could press multiple things, but okay, let's copy this. 
drop it in here, run it, and one, two, three, yeah, kind of. Okay, so now if I'm pressing one and I try one of the others, it's not going to do that because the first condition was met. If I press two now, press one, it will do that, you see, because one's the first condition. So that's what the, that's what the difference here is. So if I'm holding one, it's not going to uh, respond to the other two because this, this thing here is met and it's not going to even try these. If I'm holding uh, two and then I press one, one will take over or supersede because it's the first condition. So that, that seems to be the difference there. That was exercise three or part of exercise three. And what have we got? The else statement. So do we have an else in here at the minute? No. So if none of these conditions are met, all we're doing is, is looping around and waiting. So what we're going to do here, here's a short example using two buttons where we just print no button presses if none of the buttons are being pressed. So yeah, you can see here, if button one, then print that. Else if button two. So if button one wasn't being pressed, but button two is. Otherwise, no buttons are being pressed. And that will just output that a lot because it's going to sit in this loop and do that. So let's get rid of that. Let's try running this. And what we can expect is a lot of no button presses. And then when I press button one, it takes over button two. So, on. so let's stop that because it's just going to console log stuff forever otherwise. So now we know what if and elif, elif and else do, let's put them to work. And oh, we're going to use the LEDs. So we are going to maybe link the button presses to the LEDs, I guess, which would make sense. The code below first checks if we've held button one together. So one and two together. We can do this by an if with an and. So that's making like a complex condition. So if both of these things are true, then we'll, we'll do the statements in that block. And then we do an elif to see if one's pressed on its own and an else to light the red light. Okay. So it's sort of like a traffic light example. So I'm going to copy this into Bonnie again, and then we'll look at it in here. So same preamble. We've got our uh, our buttons here. Look, they're, they're inputs. And then we've got something we had yesterday. We've got the LEDs, their outputs. So you can see that these pins can be in or out. Yeah, you know, we don't have to use like 18 could be an output if we configured it that way. 13 could be an output or an input. And yeah, then the numbers aren't necessarily linked to them being one or the other. So we've got those three, red, amber, and green. And we determined yesterday that they are wired up correctly, even though we can't see that until they're turned off. So hopefully I haven't knocked any of the whoops, any of the components out of position and, uh, and broken that LED circuit because we haven't tested that today. Then we're going to say if button one is one, so pressed, and button two is one, so both of those things, then we're going to say print that out. We're going to turn the green LED on and the red off. Otherwise, if button one is pressed, we're going to turn amber on and red off. I guess we're not doing anything with state of green there. Um, and then if no buttons are being pressed, we'll have just red. Ah, uh -huh. OK. So run this. And we're going to need to move things around. So no buttons are being pressed, red. Button one is being pressed on its own. So that's the amber condition. Let's just scroll the code to see that. Yep, so amber and red, so that works. Uh, and then what's our other condition? One and two. So if I press one, hold down two, so you can now see it's a bit bright on the camera because these are not diffused LEDs, but you can see that two of them are on and it's not the red one, so it's the amber and the green because when I let go of that, it goes back to red. And so on. So we've got different conditions going off here. We've got a weird sort of manually controlled then be traffic light. So yeah, so we've done that. Activity for this button or that button. So different sorts of logic here. So another trick we can use with the buttons and if statements 
is to use or. So we used and up here, right? So both of these have to be true. If we used or, it would mean um, if button one was pressed or button two was pressed. And this is Boolean logic. So like in normal like English, you would sort of, if I said to you, do you want a, a Mars bar or a Snickers bar, you wouldn't necessarily assume that having both was an option. But in Boolean logic, having both is also an option, it's true. So if we use strictly or, you would be like button one could be pressed or button two could be pressed or both of them together. So we'll see where they go with this. Um, so we are going to do if button one or button two is pressed, then turn the green LED on. So let us copy that. And we've still got the red one running. So the red one is on from this code. So I'm going to see what happens here when we run this. So what you'll notice is the red one didn't go off because we didn't tell it to. So I was wondering if like redefining, oh no, it's only using this. Okay, so nothing's changed with the state of the red one because the code doesn't do anything with it. So it's still, we didn't tell the Pico to do anything else. It's still lit it up. Um, so if I press button one or button two, we should expect green to go on for two seconds and then go off. So let's press there we go, green, I'm not touching anything, and it's off. Button two, green, not touching anything, it's off. Both together, what should we expect? Remember, this is kind of a good, good result. If I'm asking you, do you want a Mars bar or a Snickers? Why not both? Uh, both works. So the red one is still on because we basically didn't have any code here to turn it off or initialize it. Um, and the all statements working as we would expect. So that's all good. This is a long one today, activity five. So another handy feature we can use with GPIO pins is toggle. As you might have guessed, this toggles a pin status from high to low to high and so on. Oh, I guess so we don't have to remember in a variable what the current status of the, the pin is and then like do not that status to invert it. So this is mostly the same, but uses button one to toggle the red LED on and off. Ah, so they're kind of fixing the, the thing we have where the red LED is. So button one is pin 13, red LED is pin 18. And what we're gonna say is every time the button is pressed, just toggle whatever value is sent out to pin 18. So if it's on, turn it off. If it's off, turn it on. But we don't need to maintain any variables that say what the current state is. So yeah. try this. And stop and run. So over there, we've got a red. It's still on. Now, every time I press it, if I allow the short delay, we've essentially built a light switch, right? So this is going on and off and on and off. And there we go. And I think that's the end of today. So day three complete. So yesterday was all about outputs, I guess. Today was all about inputs, uh, and they're both physical things. And it says, do not disassemble the circuit. So I'll make sure not to do that. Um, and we will continue this on probably Monday at this point. I need to still do some maths to see if I've got enough days before Christmas to fit in all of the projects, or if we have to do a bonus day somewhere where we just like knuckle down and do two days worth of stuff. Um, the only other thing that I got for the stream today, I said nothing, um, nothing much. Or you can't expect the post box to be like every day there's something in the post box because that's not how it works. But um, I did find something yesterday that I thought I would share here really briefly. Um, and again, if you follow me over on, we are still going to call it Twitter. If you follow me on Twitter, you will have seen this already. But uh, let's bring 
this back. So yesterday, whilst I was out looking for breakfast items at the well-known German supermarket, it's not the BBC here, so we can just say it was Lidl. Um, I was in Lidl and I wanted some breakfast. So I got banana and a pano raisin, which it kind of irks me that the singular of pano raisin should have an S on the end of raisin because there's more than one raisin in your pan. But anyway, um, turns out Lidl sells space shuttles. So I acquired a space shuttle, which is in the form of a Lego kit. So at some point we'll have to do that. But there is the significantly bigger actual like proper NASA Discovery Space Shuttle kit that I received as a very generous present for my birthday recently. So um, at some point we'll probably show some element of that. I hope to build that soon, but I'm not entirely sure doing like a 10 hour live stream of building it would be that compelling. Um, but anyway, just follow us on Twitter and I might post some pictures or something. So that's it for this week. It's Friday here. Um, I'm not going to do this over the weekend. So we will be back on probably Monday with, let's just put this back, box four. So whatever's in box four, again, I have no idea. I'm not looking ahead on this. We'll do box four on Monday. And I'm adding these to the YouTube playlist. And I might get the page up on the website in time for Monday. So there'll be like some fixed URL that you can come back to and follow this endeavor as we continue to discover what's in the pie huts uh maker advent calendar so i will bid you a good rest of your day and um go and maybe look at that sorting out that web page or something and i'll be back monday i will post when that will be on look out for it on twitter uh or subscribe on youtube and it will just be all right take care bye